Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by iFixit. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy with step by step repair guides, high quality replacement parts, and all the tools you'll need. For $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, go to ifixit.com slash twit and enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout. And by lynda.com. Learn what you want when you want with access to over 2,000 high-quality online courses and training videos, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit lynda.com slash knowhow. That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash knowhow. Coming up, you'll know how to make a data-only phone, mess with mobile VPNs, and a whole lot more. You get to run around. I'm not doing that for everybody. <laughs> oh, hi. Welcome to Know How. This is Twit's how-to program. We show you a couple of fun projects you can do yourself. I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And are you ready to do some silly things? You know what? Lay it on me. I, the sillier, the better. All right. So today, we're going to go through my absolute hatred of cell phones. I, I feel that, yes. Yeah, so for the longest time, I was a guy who, uh, this was my cell phone connection. It was a MiFi and an old iPhone 3G or an iPod Touch. That's all I would use for my phone calls, for my solutions, for everything, because I didn't want to pay, what's like like $100 a month? Yeah, I mean, those plans are ridiculous, especially since most people don't use all the unlimited minutes. Like, we give you 15,000 minutes, I might use 70. Yeah, so the ridiculous nature of this is when I was doing this back in the day, back it was the, the day. 3G days mm. of Sprint. Mm -hmm. but this is a, Ver a Virgin Mobile, which is an MVNO, which still runs on Sprint, but um, man, was it slow. But you know, something happened along the way. There was a huge development when it came to Apple iPads. They had this data connection that was dirt cheap. It was 20 bucks a month for one gigabyte, and then it gets more expensive. As I'm a frugal person, I only use the $20 version for my device, and you can turn it off whenever. So I was thinking, what if I could make a data-only device using the SIM out of a Verizon LTE iPad? Surely you must be joking. Me? I don't joke. Maybe last week I did. Last week, that's right, that's right. So here's, so here's the deal. With, with LTE, the Switch to LTE, Verizon had to use SIM cards. Mm -hmm. Verizon's phones didn't used to have SIM. That didn't work, so you'd only do that with GSM. So I got my Verizon iPad a long time ago, the iPad 3. What do they do right after the iPad 3? iPad 4? Yeah, and they just they switched it they, within like eight months, and I was angry, super angry. So I switched it out for the 4. I had an iPad 4 up till last week, which I sold. but. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because the iPad 4 and lower used a micro SIM. And what I wanted to do was to create a device like an iPhone that had the SIM of an iPad. What that would let me do is have access to Verizon's LTE network, in theory. In theory. In theory, because who knows if it'll work. Right. Swap the SIM out from the iPad into the iPhone, and then I would be able to actually access the network. iPad 4 is pretty cool and everything, but the thing, it comes in this micro SIM. Mm -hmm. Now, a micro SIM is about this size. I don't know if you can see this. It's really tiny. Let me show you that versus a nano SIM. We'll put it right over here. Can we get the overhead? So that's a micro SIM. And I have a bunch of SIMs sitting around. This Aww, is a nano SIM. So cute. Now, the nano SIM is the thing that goes into an iPhone 5 and higher. And that's the kind of phone I was looking at. And uh, you can actually, sh I, can, I can figure out a way to get this SIM into an iPhone. So I can open this up. I actually had to buy a kit to convert things because once, once I take this device, if I want to make this micro SIM into a nano SIM, you know what I got to do? Cut it. I've got to cut the oh. SIM. You've done this before? I, d I did this when I was out of the country and I have to say I was not happy. I thought it was great. I actually used it as a template. I had a nano SIM right next to it. I got a pair of scissors and I was just cutting along the edges. Totally did not fit. And now it's held into my phone with tape. Yeah, so this here is a tool from Nusi. Now, I found this actually sitting around the studio. Just, you know, because this is Twit. We're just it, bound yeah, to find this. We, yeah. And it looks like a stapler, but what it is, is it's a SIM cutter. Now, if I pop, if I pop the SIM out of my iPad right now, this kit here, this is my iPad. My, this is my iPad Air. This is the brand new one. I'll show you what this looks like. Just pop this little tool in, pop out the SIM. 
You might notice something different about my sim compared to a proper nano sim. <laughs> so this is a proper nano sim here. Mm. No, you, no, they're identical. Do you I see the, the scarring the there? I'll tell you what happened. I took one of these, these sims here, one of these micros. I popped it into this cutter over here. And I'll tell you, let's see if I actually want to have the guts to do this today, because I just haven't even activated this one. It got stuck when I was trying to get this through. So eventually I had to slam this down on the floor. I basically put it down on the ground and slammed it until it popped through. And that's why it looks like this. It looks a little scarred. Surprisingly, it still works. Now, I don't recommend doing that. So no, it seems a little no, crazy. No. And the other thing is, in case, in case I wanted to be able to go back to my old iPad, I have all these adapters. I bought these adapters. It's a little kit. Let me show you these. So I can put this nano SIM into a micro SIM slot or a larger slot if I want to with these little cards. Nice. This is dirt cheap. It's about like seven bucks. It even came along with this uh, nifty opener and this little container. I don't know why you'd want it on your... So and, you know, this, this is why you want to actually run it through a cutter rather than just trying to cut it with scissors because mine would not work in these adapter plates. Since it's such an odd shape because I had to retrim it, it would still slide around. If you use a cutter that's actually designed for it, you will get a sim with the proper shape and size. So, so we got this cut sim. Now what that allows us to do is take my old iPad sim, I could pop it into the new iPad, or maybe even put it into something like an iPhone. Now the first thing I actually tested out was on this Windows phone. If you can see this, it's shattered. It's seen better days. Why am I using this phone? Because the owner of this phone, Alex Gumpel, wasn't using it anymore. Can you see why he wasn't using it? Because it's kind of smashed. But I wanted to see if it worked because I didn't want to shell out the money for a brand new iPhone or an 8, uh, HTC 8X without uh, knowing if this would work. So all you got to do is pop open the SIM tray. Same thing. And this one uses something larger than a nano SIM. You can see that? It doesn't quite fit, right? Right, so you use your adapter, pop them in, and I found this actually works on a Windows phone, an Android phone, I tried it with a Galaxy S3, it worked, and of course the iPhone. Surprisingly, the iPhone does work. I'm gonna pop this and show you. This is a nano SIM I activated earlier. Now, why did I use a nano SIM? Where is it? Because the, <laughs> you're messing with me, Brian. The nano SIM because the iPad had nano SIMs. Now you can buy those things on Amazon, by the way. Mm -hmm. You don't have to buy an iPad to get a nano SIM. I just don't want to get these all mixed up. Give me one second. Grab this. You know, one of the cool things is as the phones are getting more and more advanced, we're seeing more of these high-end phones that support all bands. They're all built in there so that you can go from carrier to carrier. Uh, I remember, you know, not too long ago, even five years ago, you were absolutely locked. Even between, say, GSM or CDMA carriers, you couldn't go from Verizon to Sprint. You couldn't go from T-Mobile to AT&T without some major drawbacks. That's, that's less and less, which makes something like this more important. Now, if you're using an iPad 4 or lower, that uses a micro SIM, right? And I was explaining that before. I wanted to use a nano SIM in that. Maybe I could activate it that way. That way I didn't need to cut mm. the card. Mm. Maybe that would be the way to go. It turns out when you do that, you get an activation error on your actual oh. iPad. It says, call Verizon. So I called the Verizon and I said, Hey, could you check this out? And they said, what's the IME, e, IMEI number? They said, that SIM isn't compatible with your device. Oh, come on. So they kind of know that the, the nano SIM belongs to an iPad mini or an iPhone, but not an iPad 4 or lower. Now, by the way, I, I failed to mention a disclaimer. This will probably violate the terms of service, or maybe it'll violate the terms of service. But as far as I know, when it comes to LTE and SIM cards, you're allowed to move the SIM from device to device to device. So you should be able to do this. Why Verizon would care whether I'm using a device this size or this size, I'm not quite sure, but it's one of the workarounds I like to use right now. So if it violates the terms of service, get a second SIM card in case you don't want to have ruin your main one because I haven't done that with mine. Let's see here. Now, I told you about the nano SIM thing. If you use a nano SIM in a micro SIM slot, it might not work when it comes to your iPad. This is running on the Verizon LTE network right now. Nice. Now, what's the downside? Can't make phone calls with the traditional app. I can't simply go, if I play the actual f the phone app, I'll go to the phone app right now. Mm -hmm. I've actually put the phone app away because I wouldn't use it because it doesn't work. I'll call this number. I always call movie phone when I'm making these calls because I don't want somebody to get mad at me. We're sorry, your service does not allow you to complete this call message DU0. So if you put a data only SIM in one of these devices, you can't make a phone call. Now you're like, what's the use of this? This is terrible. I can't make phone calls. You just got to use a different app. That's what I've been doing forever with my iPod touches and every other device. If I use something like Hangouts, 
because they just added mm -hmm. phone calls that way, Hangouts, and I'll dial in my favorite movie phone. You actually have to confirm the call, and we wait. Put it on speaker. So now, it's essentially, it's a SIP call. It's going over the data network. Welcome to Movie ah, Phone. How about that? And it actually works, yeah. So we're using, we're using that. The thing is about Verizon's LT network, it's crazy robust. So you'll be able to do things that I couldn't do with these devices back then, because a 3G connection was really unforgiving in my experience. FaceTime works pretty well in 3G, but when it comes to LTE, even the low speeds are all right. I've used, uh, I've used FaceTime on this device. I've used Google Hangouts and Skype, and they work pretty well. Now, I've been using this for a couple of days, so I don't know if Verizon's gonna get, you know, get wise and go, wait a second, what are you doing there? That's not gonna work, but right now it's been working. It's working on every device I've tried it out, and it's, it's actually a data-only phone, 20 bucks a month. Now, you might be wondering something, though. A gigabyte a month, how much data is that? You can actually use the built-in tools of the phone to see how much data you're using. If you want to turn off service, though, you can't do it with this device. You've got to put it back on the iPad. You've got to go back over there, and that'll make a huge difference. I can show you what happens with the activation on this device. Let me try to actually activate one of the other, the other SIMs I've got sitting around. There's a SIM. Yeah. You know, the, this is really the future because I think consumers are finally figuring out that bytes are bytes. You know, they say, well, we're going to charge you more if you try to make a SIP call. Well, on modern phones, the call is a SIP call. It's going over a data network. It's packetized data. So they really shouldn't be separating those from data bytes, you know, quote unquote data bytes, if it's all just data. And what's been driving me crazy is the fact with LTE, the change has been, uh, has been voice over the data network. Mm -hmm. So what exactly are you paying for? So if we go to my iPad, I don't know if we got the screen. So if I want to go to activation, I can go to cellular data, and I can say, let's see, view account. Now I put a new SIM that hasn't been activated. This is where you actually set up a new account. So when you bother to put in another SIM, you'll be able to set up an account right from here. That'll give you that second SIM that you could put in your iPhone or whatever device. I'm not gonna fill this out right now because it uses my credit card information, but it will work. It's a crazy workaround if you wanted to save a ton of money, 20 bucks a month for Verizon's network. And I love Verizon's network, so that's why I wanted to stick with them. It's really robust, it's worked so far. Uh, probably around January is when I think I'm gonna shell out some money for an actual phone. Leo Laporte graciously let me borrow his iPhone 5S and I don't wanna break it, it's really pretty. I really like the way it is. I wanted a mobile camera right, effectively. Right. And you know what, it's not just geek, it, you get a little bit of sticking it to the telco, sticking it to the man. I mean, they're gonna overcharge you, I don't think so. Take control of your data plan, take control of your phone calls by doing this, the data only phone. All right, we should take a quick break and thank our friends at iFixit because they are sponsoring this episode of Know How. You know, iFixit, you probably hear about them a lot online. When a new device comes out, they tear it apart and they show you how repairable something is. We've actually seen the teardowns for the iPad Air already. Uh, they've got a ton of repair guides. So you've, I know you've heard of iFixit at this point. Uh, there's also tons of things you might not know about iFixit, including this new toolkit. They sell a whole bunch of tools this here is the ProTech Toolkit. Uh, it's got tons of tools for us. Let me clean off my little area. And I'll show you, I'll show you something here. There's, there's this driver kit, lots of bits. You know, lots of these phones use things like pentalobe screws, right? There's pentalobe screws on certain things like an iPhone. There are bits for that. Now, we can run a video where I replaced the screen on my Samsung Galaxy S3. So there's my video there. So what you can't see under the lower third is on my iPad, I'm actually at iFixit's website and I'm looking at their guide on how to replace the screen. I didn't just replace the glass, I replaced the entire screen assembly. Now that's my shattered screen that fell, uh, <laughs> that's the result of falling out of a roller coaster pocket. I was in a roller coaster, fell out of my pocket and boom, it was on the ground. Absolutely kind of shattered, horribly shattered. Decided to replace it, used iFixit's guide and tools to take apart my Samsung Galaxy S3, and I put a new screen using all of the tools in this kit, a really phenomenal resource when it comes to great tools. There's so many pieces, like you need these little plastic spudgers. I'm not even kidding you, when it comes to removing things like the logic board in this, a lot of adhesive is involved. You wanna pry them gently with spudgers like this. iFixit's guides are great, and these tools are fantastic. And uh, this is my phone right now, if you could see that, Yes, I shattered it again because I dropped it in my driveway from a height of about three feet. 
Very, very depressing. You were testing. You were testing. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to, now that I've actually used the iFixit Tools Kit to replace it once, I'm going to replace it again. There'll be a new video of that because I happen to have another screen just at the ready. There's all kinds of things that, by the way, you should really be using if you're going to be messing with computers. I know we're all bad at this. We don't use our, our static wrist strap and make sure that we're not going to fry components. It's available in this kit. I showed you the spudgers. There's even a suction cup. You'd be like, why a suction cup? Uh, I know what that's for. It's pulling screens out of the cases once you've got the seal removed. Yeah, well, like something like an iMac, yeah, right? Exactly. So you got this on there, and they also have to, uh, repair kits for all of that. Like I mentioned before, all of these, these bits in here. There's even bits, the triangular bit, if you want to take apart a McDonald's toy or a, <laughs> a Happy Kit. There's so many different bits in here. I can't even list them all. All the spiders I've already messed with. It's super lightweight, and this tool kit is just a phenomenal value. I'm a big fan of it. You know, you know what I found out about these kits? It's, there's a lot of people who think, oh, well, I've, I've got a good tool kit. I've got a multi-purpose screwdriver. I've got little blades that I can slip under screens to pry them out. But when you have a kit that's actually dedicated for geeks who like to hack their devices, you don't have to worry about like stripping out bits because you're using just one size too small or cracking the side of your screen because you're using a putty knife instead of a spudger. Yeah. It, you know, having actual dedicated gear really does make things better. Yeah, it's about 65 bucks. It has a one year warranty and the holidays are just around the corner. The ProTech Toolkit is a perfect gift for any geek, hobbyist, or do-it-yourselfer. So instead of having somebody like just recreate this after years and years of collecting bits, you can get one kit all in one right here thanks to iFixit. Now with iFixit, you can fix it yourself. Visit iFixit.com slash twit for free step-by-step -step guides. iFixit also sells every part and tool you'll need. Plus, if you enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout, you'll save $10 off any purchase of $50 or more. That's iFixit.com slash twit. We thank iFixit for the support of KNOWHOW. So, we got a long-term review coming yeah, up. Yeah, we do. Remember, this is our uh, segment on the show where we take a product and we run it through real-world use. This is not just one of those, ah, this is the box, this is what it looks like, it's shiny, it works. No. We're actually going to show you the product and then show it to you again months down the road to see whether or not it met expectations. Yeah, so one line. Happy to buy. All right, so we're going to do a long-term review of this device. This is the Pogo Plug Series 4. Now, we covered this way back in Know How 1. And after that episode, after I got to try it out, I bought one for myself. I've had this since August of 2012. I've been using this pretty much every day. And if you forgot what it was, this device is a server. You attach a hard drive to it or an SD card if you want as your storage. It's got two USB ports in the back so you can attach hard drives. And it gives you access to your files anywhere you have an internet connection. Also, with the Pogoplug software, in your local network, you'll be able to mount this as a network drive. That way, you can have access on your home network really fast speeds or online. It might be a little slower because that'll depend on your internet connection. Now, one of the cooler things about Pogoplug is that they have apps for iOS and Android, and they also allow you to do automatic camera backups. So if I've taken videos or I've taken pictures, it'll automatically go to this hard drive at home. And unlike Dropbox or any of those other competitors, I don't have to pay for more storage. It's only limited by the hard drives I've, I've attached. This is a three terabyte drive I've got attached to this device. And right now the Pogo Plug is attached to the network and I can access this pretty much anywhere. Uh, I've got the Pogo Plug app here, which we'll show. And it's actually showing you an image. This is on the Verizon network. I'm not even on the local network. Here's a picture of me when I was in college with my best friend Rob. That's actually being served off of that. I can go into other devices, let's see, other things I can see. Uh, my music if I wanted to, my video library, which is basically what I use this for. And you'll see that in the long run. Here's my H.264 video of all my movies. Now, one of the things you're going to realize is if you have movies on this device, it's gonna take a while for it to load. So let's pick something that's small. Like, bring it on. One of my favorite movies of all time. Now, it's going to give you a little pop-up, say, watch original. And I've actually optimized this for something like an iPad. Everything is, you can see M4Vs here. You get to determine what's uh, actually running on the hard drive. You can see it's trying to buffer right now. And you can see the little light back here going because the hard drive is being accessed. This might take a while because we're on the Verizon network. And this is taking some time. It's a 700 megabyte file. If you're going to access Pogo Plug anywhere, you can actually do it on a browser. You can go to mypogoplug.com, you sign in with your username credentials, and then you have access to all the files you would normally. So you could just go to a friend's house and watch your movies 
on a browser if you wanted to without having to download any software. So the Pogo Plug software will also scan your drive for photos and albums. If you look on the left here, it actually shows you a timeline of all the photos I've uploaded over the years. Now I've been using the Pogo Plug nonstop for pretty much over a year, and the reason is I haven't had any reason to look for anything else. Back in episode one of Know How, we tried out Tonito, we tried out Pogo Plug, and there were other services out there. But Pogo Plug has been absolutely phenomenal in its usage, at least in the day-to-day -day kind of thing. If you're writing lots of files as a local drive, it's probably a bad idea to use it as a NAS, I gotta say. I've seen some errors with the Mac software when it's actually used as a local drive, but on Windows, it's been just fine. I'm not sure what's up with that. Seems like it's a Pogo Plug software issue. Uh, but I basically use this to read a lot of my videos in my home network, and also when I'm on the road. So there it goes, bring it on right there. So if I was on the road, I could be able to access all of my files. So whether Netflix has it or not, it doesn't matter. I have it, so I have access. And again, the fact that I never have to upload stuff. So if I want to share a file, if I've made a video for somebody and they want to download it, I just give them a Pogo Plug link, and I don't have to wait for Dropbox to go on. I know if there are nights where I've left my Mac Pro on all night because it's uploading to Dropbox so I can send a share link. That's kind of lame. This thing doesn't use anywhere near as much power as that. And it's dirt cheap. I bought this thing when it was $60. And you can probably get them used for about $30 at this point. It's a really powerful piece of hardware when it comes to serving up stuff. On the downsides, by the way, if, if you saw that little pop-up says optimize or watch original, because this device is so small and doesn't take a lot of power, when you want to optimize something, it's trying to transcode. This thing is not really good for transcoding. So if you've got a five gigabyte Dark Knight Rises video and you try to transcode it on the fly, yeah, it's gonna kill this thing. It's gonna take forever. So don't bother to do that. Uh, again, this is really, for me, has been a read only for the most part and the automatic backup for my camera roll and my videos, which has been really good. Uh, again, this is the Pogo Plug Series 4. I'm really happy with it. Uh, I wanna see what Pogo Plug does next because I, I really quite like this. Now, we're doing the show live on a Thursday, and there's a chat room if you're not aware. So if you download the show at you know, twit.tv slash kh, you might not know that we do the show live around 3 o'clock Pacific time uh, on live.twit.tv. And we have a chat room. Somebody in the chat room asking, why do you pay $50 a year to Pogo Plug? There's no service fee. I'm not paying $50 a year. That product is $50. Yeah. I bought it once. If you want to get cloud storage through them, they do have their own other services. But I don't see the point of that. I use my own hard drive for my storage. But if you want to back up to their cloud, you could do that as well. That's a whole other thing. Uh, but I'm only paying 50 bucks for mine, and I paid for it once. There's no service fee once you get that. Unless you keep breaking them. <laughs> well, yeah, that... Like every month. <laughs> Considering it's... Day yes, if you're breaking it every month, you're right. <laughs> I walk up to it, Smack. hit it with a hammer. Done now. So that's a subscription right. service. There we go. So it would be a shame if something happened to your pogo plug. <laughs> 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 let's uh, let's talk about some security then. Yeah. Some other security. So instead of like somebody strong ar arming you, you're going to show us some mobile VPN solutions. I'm right, going to show you some mobile VPN stuff. So you, you know, everyone is a bit on edge about security now, right? Because Absolutely. We're worried about being spied on. We're worrying about what kind of data is being collected, and we know that there are VPN solutions for computers and for desktops that work quite well, but. VPN solutions for mobile devices, phones and tablets, haven't always been the easiest to configure. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you a couple of different ways you can secure your data, make sure that it's it's okay, make sure that it's it's you know running well, that mm -hmm. that no one is is looking at what you're doing. What I'd like to do first is show you what it looks like if someone is tapping your machine. So I've got a Android phone right here that's connected to the setup. If Brian will look at our overhead setup, we're duplicating the internet. We've essentially made our own internet right now using uh, this DDWRT router, using this switch, using this really cool, uh, super advanced Xerus wireless AP. Is it heavy? I hear the internet's really light. Th yeah, it's because it's, it's wireless. It's, you know? Exactly. Internet is wireless. The IT crowd, IT crowd, geek reference. And this tap. This tap is what's going to let me peek in on whatever's going through this phone to the internet. So if Brian will now show my, uh, my capture screen here, what you'll see is this is Wireshark showing you the data that's running through that network. So if I start up a browser, there you go. You start to see data running through. So if I go to CNN, 
these are my DNS queries. So of course I can see, oh look, there's CNN, here's money.cnn, there's an ad click. It, again, it's showing me all the different DNS queries that's running through here, including iTunes, Apple, Android, a lot of CNN links, and double click. Again, we don't really want that because someone who's just tapped into our, our wireless or tapped into our ISP will be able to find at minimum where we're going, not, not to uh, mention that they also might be able to find the payload. Right, you don't want any of that information being compromised, so what should we do? So here's what we're going to do. We are going to use a VPN for the mobile. VPN is virtual private mm -hmm. network. The easiest way to do it is to use a VPN service. Now here at the network we have as an advertiser ProXPN. I actually used them before they became an advertiser on Twit, which is why I was excited that they joined. They have an app and it's, it's really, really simple. This is what the app looks like. If you'll go back to my uh, product page, it's downloaded onto my Android phone and I just started up. If you know how to put in a username and a password, that's, that's pretty much well, all you Slow down, do. college boy. I know. A I username right? and password, okay. Username right. and password, and I go ahead and click connect, and it's going to say, yes, I trust uh, the application. And up in the upper corner here, you'll see, yes, now we're protected. So uh, ProXPN is now saying, uh, we're good, and as soon as it turns green, yes. See this little key? Uh, okay, there's a little key. That teeny tiny key tells me, okay, now all my traffic is being encrypted. All right, now, what's the proof? I mean, it looks, it works exactly the same way. Here I go to CNN, I'm gonna go to different websites. It, the, the, the device itself doesn't notice anything that's different, but what does my capture screen look like? So I'm gonna go ahead and restart this capture, and let's, uh, let's go to a different website. I'm gonna go to Wired. All right, let's see if we can see anything. Nope, we got what? See, see that, that's, the, that's the wireless AP. Notice how nothing is showing up. The DNS queries have been obfuscated. In fact, if I clear out the DNS filter here, you can see all the different data that's running through. These are all encrypted. You can't tell what's going through them. You can't tell what kind of packets there are. You can't tell what's in the payload. So is someone listening in with Wireshark, yeah, they'll capture this. They'll, they'll see a source and a destination, but that's all been obfuscated because it's going through that VPN service. All they know is that your device is talking to a VPN service. They don't know what kind of packet you're sending. They don't know what's in the packets, and they don't know where that service is sending you to. So if they're actually spying on your network and there's a whole bunch of people on that, let's say uh, if you're hanging at a local coffee place right. and you're using their Wi-Fi, and if somebody's actually in the middle and they're sniffing everybody's packets, if they see that, they're not going to bother to continue try to decrypt your stuff, they're going to be looking for somebody who's not using a VPN because that stuff's going to be out in the clear. You don't need to be the most secure user on the network. You just have to not be the least secure. Yeah, it's kind of like what happened in the old days in New York. You used to have clubs on the car. You remember <laughs> the, cl the club? Because the idea was, ah, it's a pain in the neck. They'll move to the next car. Just make uh, it that much harder. Then you just get a hack, so you just remove exactly. the thing yeah, off. Yeah. They Solid. figured that out. Thieves are very smart. Yeah. Now, I will say I like using this service because it, it's really easy to use. I mean, I can load this onto my, my parents' phones, my parents' tablets, and have them log in every time they, they go out to make sure that they're secure. But there is a monthly service fee, and there is one big other disadvantage, and that is because you're using a VPN service and not like a VPN appliance, I can't get into my own network. This doesn't put right. me behind my firewall so that, let's say I'm traveling, I can now access my own NAS, my own computer, my own printers, whatever it might be. It's, it's secure and it's encrypted, but it doesn't grant me access to the stuff that maybe I would want. But it also means that you don't have to deal with the maintenance of an appliance. You're not the one responsible for right. the actual administration of it. It's simply, hey, something went wrong. You contact these guys. You're like, hey, what, what, what went wrong? They'll let you know. Granted, you can't go ahead and access your local files, as you're mentioning. You could probably figure a way around right. that anyway. Yeah. But that's, that's a kind of a turnkey solution. Exactly. Yeah, you pay $5 a month or less, depending on if you've used our Twit codes. And uh, boom, you're done. You're, you're, you're ready to be encrypted, and you know you're safe. And you can test it yourself. By using a setup like this, you can actually look at your own traffic and make sure that they're actually delivering on the encryption that they promised. Now, let's move on from that. That's our super simple pay-per-month type solution. Here's one that gets a bit more advanced. This is one of my favorite. This is a SonicWall TZ215. It's a security appliance. Now this is fully loaded. By what fully loaded means is they put all the security software that they, they have on this. So if you bought this, this would actually be about 
twelve hundred dollars. Twelve hundred bucks. Yeah, but they start they start down the three in three hundred, and yeah. they will do the mobile. Now, connect. you know, in this episode, we talked about I'm a frugal man. I'm not paying eighty <laughs> bucks a month for service. I'm paying twenty bucks a month for Verizon LTE. What can we do that's uh, not as expensive as this twelve hundred dollars? I'm sure it's a fantastic device, but I know we can probably hack something together. Right, exactly. So let's say you don't want to go the Sonic Wall uh, route. I mean, it, it's very cool. It, it also runs an app. Uh, you know, Brian, if you, actually, if you show my screen again, uh, oops. So we've got Sonic Wall. Yeah, you've got the app. Sonic Wall app. And, and uh, if you look at my Android device, it looks almost exactly like the Pro XPN thing. And it's, it's again, you just you need a username and a password. And this one will give you a secure tunnel back to your own network. It will let you access your computer, let you access your resources. One big disadvantage, however, is that it will look as if you're coming from your home router. Okay. So if you were trying to obfuscate where you're coming from, that's not a really good way to do it. And it also means you still have to trust your your ISP because At it's home, encrypted right. to your house and then it's unencrypted. So right? you've got to secure your house on top of that so you get some other work to do right. if you wanted to do that. So this is the route I would go just because I don't like futzing around with a lot of gear that may or may not work. The, the TZ215, it works every single time. Once you get it configured, it's rock solid. But oh, go ahead. no, no monthly fees or anything. No monthly fees. You pay the twelve hundred bucks. You own this thing outright. You take care of it. You own it. You take care Everything of it. Everything works You're that good way. to go. Right. Okay, so that's right. that's an, it's one of those. You buy it once. You don't have to worry about the service fee. But then again, you have to worry about the administration. Right. Mm -hmm. What else can we do? Okay, here's where we're gonna get geek. We need again. This is the nerd alert because uh, your this whole show. I keep telling you is nerd alert. It is nerd alert. The whole thing is yes, yes. You could. Use DDWRT, which we are fans of because you talked about it in episode three. So if you want to know how to install DDWRT, which is a router firmware, onto your device of choice, go to episode three of Know How, and uh, Iaz and Leo Laporte will take you through exactly how that works. You can use DDWRT to enable a VPN server for nothing. If you already own the hardware, it's free. Yeah, but this this is one. You're basically getting your hands dirty. This isn't like turnkey solution versus I'm, I'm going to build a kit car. That's right. basically what you're doing here. We're going to take a, a router that wasn't meant for this kind of thing, although the hardware does support pretty much everything you're going to do. After we get DDWRT on our Linksys router or any router at that point, well, almost any router, what do we do now? Okay, now once you've got DDWRT installed on your device, there are a few things you need to know. First of all, you have to make sure it's a recent version of DDWRT. And by recent, I mean within the last four years. There, four there, years? That's that's a long time in, in internet time. It's, an, it's a long time, but some people still have really old installations. The other thing to know is if your DDWRT router of choice is barely hanging on, so it's one of these really old first gen, it can almost not do wireless without, without crapping out every other week. You're probably not going to want to do this because so you, you're going to overtax you're it. You're basically saying if you've got a Linksys router like this one here yeah. that actually was made by Linksys before Cisco bought it right. and before Belkin bought that, mm -hmm. probably not the best solution. Right. So like on this box, I've actually turned off all the wireless functions mm -hmm. to make room for the VPN functions. So you might be better off with something from like Buffalo. Correct. That actually runs DDWRT as, as its actual default uh, firmware because they're also pretty beefy when it comes yeah, exactly. to everything. exactly. They've so. got plenty of memory, plenty of power. It, it, those are better solutions. I'm using this because it's lying around and also because I don't mind turning off the wireless functions just to demo VPN. You're so green. We're recycling. Okay. okay. Like, we like to recycle. Wireless G is even in green. Okay. okay. Let's no, keep... Seriously, this is like one of the very first ones. I know. I've got I one. Electronics. Okay. Now, if you don't have the VPN tab, and actually go ahead and go to my screen, this is what the VPN tab looks like right here under services you're going to see this. If you don't have that VPN tab, then it means you need to update your installation. If it is there, you're good to go. Now, a few things before we start mucking around with this. Please, 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 please don't do this with your primary router, OK? <laughs> because if you brick it, if you put it into a funky configuration state, you're going to need to troubleshoot. Where are you going to go to troubleshoot? Probably to the internet. If you just bricked your router, Sad trombone. Now it's become your spare router because you're going to go exactly. out to the store and go you get a go new buy one. Another one. You're going to get another one. Right. So, <laughs> so you know, get this with a backup piece of gear. Just test it a couple of times. Make sure it works to your liking before you actually do surgery on the gear that's running your network. Now, my step two is something that I, I, I hold very near and dear. I wish more, more people would do it. I wish I would do it more often, and that is document. Document, document, document. Before you flip a switch, jump into your router and get all, at least, at least, 
the critical pieces of information. That means your external IP. So what is the real IP address out into the world? Your internal IP. What's the IP that devices on the inside are going to see? Get your subnet mask. Make sure you know your DNS servers. Make sure you know your IP range. All that information may seem like, oh, well, I'll remember it, but Again, no, you won't. You won't. No, you won't remember that. You're like, it was a 255 or was it 225.225 or was it 25? Yeah, you'll, you'll mess that up. I end up usually taking screenshots or even a screen recording because I have something as evidence to go, oh, good, this happens. Also, my memory is absolute. It's terrible. So yeah. I do that anyway, and it's always good to have a backup. And at, at worst case scenario, well, you have an extra. <gasps> oh, no, extra information, mm -hmm. not a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, so we're going to get into the VPN segment. I will note at first, because I know the security hardcore out there are going to be yelling at me, I know that the VPN server within DDWRT has been deprecated because there is a security flaw. In fact, I believe Steve Gibson talked about this on an episode of Security Now. But you can't exploit it without quite a bit of work. So as a learning VPN, as, as a device to just install and play with, this is wonderful. This is easy. Eventually, you're going to want to end up in OpenVPN, but that's a bit more complicated to install and configure. That's why we're starting with the VPN server built in, WDDWRT. Thank you. All right, so get me back into my screen, and let me show you how easy it is to do this. The first thing you're going to want to do is you get into this VPN tab, and I already have a lot of my settings done. It looks like this. You've got two boxes, your PPTP server and your PPTP client. Of course, we're going to want to use PPT, PPTP server. When we enable that, we get all of these drop-down options. This is all default. Leave everything on default except what I'm going to show you. In the server IP, you want to type the address, the real address that your router has for the outside world. Now, we've created a, a fake internet here because we don't want anyone messing with our demonstration. But Ultimately, that would be like if you were in Comcast, it might be 207.97. blah, 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 blah. That's where you put that because the device needs to know where the VPN server actually lives. The second thing that you're going to want to play with is this, the client IPs. Notice how the third octet is different. Here is 192.168.1.201. Here it's 200. That's because this, this one up here the uh, server IP is the external address. The client IP is the internal range. What you're telling the server is when a device connects to me through the VPN server, give it one of these addresses. So that's important. You have to make sure that that address range isn't going to conflict with anything else you might have on your, on your network, like IaaS. You've probably set a couple of statics in your network, right? Yeah, I have to because I've, I want to be able to reach, oh, there's a number of servers I'm running. Like, I used to have Audio Galaxy. I used to have mm -hmm. a bunch of other older projects that I had running. So you forward to them. Yeah, yeah, I had a bunch of those. I've been swapping them out every now and then. I've, be, I've moved a lot. So right. Things change. Exactly. But yeah, so you, you put your range. Now, in this demo that we're showing you again, those ranges look very similar. They probably won't look like they that look like with that. your case. External IP addresses usually look a lot weirder than when right. you, the 192. And again, this is why it's important to document it because if you get it on paper, you can actually keep it straight. Oh, yeah, that's right. External address, internal ad an address. External address, internal address. That's important because if you mess that up, the VPN server is not going to work. Now, this third field, this is an important one. This is where you set your usernames and your passwords. So mine is Padre, and then you have an asterisk, twit, asterisk. So, for example, if I wanted to add IAS, I would put IAS, space, asterisk, and then have the same password, twit, space, asterisk. That's all you have to do. That sets up your user field. So when I have a device trying to connect, it can now use either Padre, password twit, or IAS, password so twit. So users on every line, you separate out the username and password with an asterisk and a space. Uh, that space is not part of the password. It's just... It's just there. That's syntax, okay. right? So it's username, asterisk, password, asterisk. Got New it. line, username, asterisk, password, asterisk. Got it. Okay. That's it. So that sets up the DDWRT VPN server. Now you have to set up your client, and uh, well, this is where it gets weird, because as we all know, clients operate differently. And I'm not just talking about iOS or Android or Windows Phone. It's actually different within versions of Android, within versions of iOS. So I'm going to give you sort of a general overlook on how you would set up, starting with my Android phone. Remember, this is my trusty, handy-dandy Android phone that I had uh, Open VPN or a Pro XPN connected. I'm now going to disconnect that. So if Brian looks at my screen, there's no key here, which means there's no longer a VPN established. Setting up a VPN is actually really simple. You go into the configuration, 
You're going to go into more networks. You're going to go into VPN. And there is KH for know-how. But I'm going to go ahead and delete that because I am so confident that it's going to work that I'm going to go ahead and recreate it. I'm going to hit the plus button to add one. And now I need to put a name so I know it's different from everything else. I'm just going to put KH. Now, you, this is the actual TouchWiz interface, right, that you've got going on your uh, right, Samsung S4. Right. So again, it could be different on your phone. But this is one of the most popular phones in the universe at this point. Probably might look like exactly. this. Exactly. Now, here's the first important piece of information, the server address. Remember, if you go back to my, uh, my configuration screen, this was the address that I typed in right here. OK, so again, document, 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 document. What That's was that? Docu what? Document. Document. OK. Document, All right, right, got it now. Right. So we're going back over here, and we're going to type in that address, which is, I'm going to do it right side up, 192.168.1.201. All right, looks good. OK, so go ahead and save that. The first time I hit it, it's going to ask for the username and the password. I type that in, Padre and password of Twit. So let me go ahead and put that in, Padre. Just type in password. a username and password. This is, this is all the setup we did earlier. It's just going to match everything like we did before. Right. And so now it's connecting. And now it's connected. So you get a little key in the upper corner here. What that means is I've now established a secure connection between this device and this router. Fantastic. Okay, so let's test it because remember when we did Pro XPN, I, I was able to surf web pages and it couldn't tell. Let's jump into Wireshark right now, and we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to go ahead and start a capture, and I'm going to go ahead and open up a web page here. Uh, I'm going to go to Twit. So, oh, actually, no, I'm going to go to Google. Let's go to Google. That up and coming search so, engine company, huh? See, nothing. I'm getting no DNS entries, and here I'm getting to Google. So, here we've got nothing. Here, we've got Google. So what I'm doing, is I'm actually going from here to the router in an encrypted tunnel over this wireless access point with the tap in between them. Because it's encrypted, Wireshark doesn't know what it is. It doesn't know what kind of packets. It can't tell what sites I'm going to. Now, you have this wireless access point, again, because you turned off all the wireless capabilities of this Correct. router. People who have other routers might not necessarily need this. Right, right. This, I just had this in my workshop. I, I really like this because it, it reduces the amount of noise that I get elsewhere. But uh, yeah, any wireless you have, that works just fine. So that's how you do it for Android. It's uh, actually a bit more complicated for iOS devices. Here is an iPad that I borrowed from John Slanina. Uh, to get into the VPN settings here, I'm going to go into Settings. I'm going to go into General. I'm going to go into V. There's a thing here for VPN. And I've already set it up. So if I go into the settings for this, it actually shows me, I gave, uh, if you can zoom in on that a little bit. Just like in the Android device, I gave it a name, I gave it the server, I gave it my username, and I gave it my password. But I also had this extra setting. Make sure you do this. This defaults to off, send all traffic. That means it's a split tunnel. So any traffic that wants to go to my local network will go over the VPN. But any traffic that just goes over the internet it would be unencrypted and it would go out into the real world. We That's don't want that. That's off by default? That's off by default. Okay, we want turn it that on. on. On by default. There we go. OK, so that gives me my, uh, uh, my settings. I'm going to go ahead and save that. Now I say VPN on. And it's going to, it's going to initialize it. And now it's connected. It gives me a countdown timer. So let's do the same thing. Brian, if you would, please, go ahead and jump back into Wireshark. I'm going to go ahead and restart a capture session. And uh, I guess, why don't you go to a website? Sure. This is a little test. We can put this on the screen at the same time if you want. Let's go to, let's see, what do I like to, let's go to CNN. Why not? No big surprise. It's going back to Wired for some reason. Did you rig this iPad, sir? <laughs> CNN.com. Go. There we go. Now it's finally loading up. And we're looking behind this Wireshark showing nothing. Right. Wireshark's actually, yeah, jump over to Wireshark. Slowly. Now, actually, this, slowly this, loading. This, this is why we're doing this. D go to Wireshark just really quickly so I can show you. Yeah, Load. there's nothing. But here is the problem with using this DDWRT. Not all the queries are going to work properly. Uh, in fact, go to Google. Go to Google. All Google right. almost always works. Let's go to Google. All right, going to Google. Google's working. Looks like it's working really anyway. Really slowly. It is really slow really in the slow. air. Now imagine if this was over the open network out in the real world. It would be even more slow because you, you need to go to your device, then back out to the world. And you have to make that trip every time a packet jumps in and out. But I can safely surf Reddit. 
Right. Ha-ha. And again, see, over here, the only thing that we're seeing is stuff that I'm getting off of, oh, my other device. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. That's my bad. You got another device I have polluting the traffic. Devices. Look yeah. at that, Marvel and Netflix are joining up. I knew that. Yeah. I watched Tech News today, they told me that. Awesome. So this, this is two different devices, two very popular devices. It's actually really in, easy in Windows machines. That's why I didn't even cover Windows machines, because if, if you've got a Windows machine, you probably know how to set up a VPN. The cool thing about this is I can use tech that I already have to set up a VPN. The bad thing, and I'm glad that the iPad gave us a little bit of trouble, is that it doesn't always work. Because we're really stretching the limits, especially on these older boxes, sometimes the queries just don't go through. Now, there are ways to fix this using IP tables and setting up a transparent proxy, but we're going to save that for another day. That's awesome. We can find out more about that. So it, it gives you security, peace of mind. You don't have to worry about selling out 1200 bucks for an appliance. So you could if you wanted to, but you can always reuse your old gadgets. Try this out. I, I know my, I have like a whole bin full of old routers. This might be something I'm going to try out for myself. Should we take a quick break and thank our, our friends at lynda.com? Let's do that. All right, so lynda.com is an online learning company, and they are sponsoring this episode of Know How, and we are big fans of these guys. Now, they let anyone learn creative software and business skills to achieve both their personal and professional goals. With a lynda.com subscription, members receive unlimited access to a vast library of high quality, current, and engaging video tutorials across a wide variety of subjects. If you guys are watching Know How, you might like software, so they got explanations for things like Dreamweaver, WordPress, PowerPoint, if you wanted to become a PowerPoint master. Business skills, I like the business skills section. If you want to learn how to negotiate a raise, perhaps, maybe you're like, hey, you know what? I don't know the best way to do that. Uh, they actually have courses about that. Even time management skills, big fan of the time management one. Tried that out myself. Hobbies, if you want to try out DSLR video, they've got that. Programming, they've got that covered too. So if you want to mess with the web, app development, CSS, SQL, they've got that and more. Now currently, I'm taking a course called Pixel Playground. It's one of the new ones added this week. Uh, there's, there's over 2,000 courses with new courses being added daily. Now this Pixel Playground uh, tutorial is actually hosted by Bert Monroy. You might know him from Pixel Perfect and other things like the screensavers. Big fan of him. And the one I'm actually looking at these days is one, uh, one video. These are short 10 minute videos. So you don't have to spend forever learning this. One is actually on how to make a flower tattoo. So you can actually place it on somebody because I've been thinking about getting a tattoo. Why not just do that, learn it in Photoshop first, place it on me before I have to live with that forever. And Photoshop is a great skill to have anyway. And I love listening to Bert. He's a fantastic educator. Did I mention that these, these guys that are hosting these are top of their field experts, okay? These instructors are working professionals and expert teachers. This is also really high quality video production. You're not seeing a camera on top of a monitor. You're not getting scan lines. You're not getting muffled audio from a YouTube video. <laughs> You're not getting any of that. You're getting high quality video. And there's new courses added every week, like I mentioned. Uh, this week, QuickBooks for Mac is out, JavaScript for web designers, teaching kids programming with PHP, and Pixel Playground with Bert Monroy. Uh, these content, uh, these, these courses are curated. Each lynda.com course is carefully structured so that users can learn from start to finish or jump to a specific chapter for quick answers. So if you're taking a longer course, you can jump around on playlists. You can actually go from device to device as well. So if you start off, on your laptop, you could move to your iPad and actually continue learning. Either you got 15 minutes or 15 hours. Lynda.com's got so many different courses for you to learn from, and you can pick up from any device. It's really fantastic. There's even searchable transcripts. That I'm a huge fan of. You can search inside a video to save time and find exactly what you're looking for. And it's only $25 a month for access to Lynda's entire course library. Or for $37.50 a month, you can subscribe to the premium plan, which includes exercise files that let you follow along with the instructor's project using the exact same assets. So you get to use what they're using. And you can try lynda.com right now with a free seven-day trial. Visit lynda.com slash know-how to access the entire library. That's over 2,000 courses free for seven days. That's lynda.com slash know-how. And we thank lynda.com for their support of know-how. They're a fantastic resource. Big fan. Hey, Ayaz, you know what I like? Um, VPNs? I like VPNs, but I also like feedback. Good. 
because we got some. All right, so we've got a message here from Jeffrey who wants to let us know that my three-year-old laptop, which I still love, was recently running low on hard disk space and its stock 320 gigabyte hard drive. I was considering going to an SSD, but found the price for a 512 gigabyte SSD just to be too high, especially for the minimal space increase that I was going to get. Being a tech professional and a fan of music and photography, I really thought it would be best to go with a one terabyte drive, but was still hoping for a performance boost along the lines of what an SSD drive might give me. After, after doing some research, I settled on a Seagate one terabyte hybrid model, which gave me a boost to my boot times with an eight gigabyte SSD, which by Seagate specs gives five times, fa five times faster boot times. So far, I'm impressed with the performance and general speed of the drive, which I've had in my machine for about six months. It's great bang for the buck and really puts new life into an older laptop. Best that's, regards, Jeffrey. That's great, Jeffrey, because we covered putting an SSD in an old yeah. laptop, but we didn't talk about hyper drives for some reason. And that's because there, sometimes you just think SSD or hard disk drive. But if you want to get a lot of capacity and you want that boot time boost, you might not have to even go full on SSD because like we mentioned before, one terabyte SSDs, Pretty pricey. Yeah. Hybrid drives, not as pricey not because what, what was his SSD? The actual is eight gigabytes. Mm. Eight gigabytes is, is solid state. So you're not gonna put everything on there, yeah. but you'll boot yeah. like that. Now, one of the things to, to know about these hybrid drives, I actually like them. I really like them because they are a nice performance slash speed slash price type price point is that you don't have any control over what goes into the SSD. The Seagate hybrid drive, which is probably the best among the hybrid drives, gives you that eight gigabyte partition or a 16 gigabyte SSD in, in a future version, but it chooses via an algorithm what goes in there. It looks at the files that are accessed most often and it puts those files in the, in the flash, in the SSD. Because IAS, as you mentioned, not everything has to be super fast, just the files that you use most often. As yeah, somebody's mentioning, the next step is to ditch the optical drive and create another drive slot. I've seen a lot of people do that. I've been looking at my old MacBook. I'm like, yeah, I don't really use that optical drive very often. I could probably use a lot more space. It's a good idea. We should, we should uh, use that idea from, was that Jimbo? Jimbo, great idea I in like the chat it. room. I, I miss the days where you could have a laptop that had two slots. Because then, then yeah, the old then, Dell days where oh, you had the double, those, you could yeah. swap them out. You put one 256 gigabyte SSD for the operating system and programs. You put a one terabyte spinning drive for everything else. Boom. Or an extra battery. That was an option. Battery. These are the old days, folks. This is back when you had swappable components. The good uh, old days. Yeah, well, that's like a history lesson. But guys, we talked about a lot of stuff today. We talked about a lot of equipment, software, figuring out ways to cut our sims. You're like, what on earth? How am I gonna remember everything you guys talked about? Well, don't worry about it. At twit.tv slash kh, we've got tons of show notes, especially for this episode. We'll have lots of explainers. What did we use? What tools? We'll have links to everything we talked about, including detailed instructions on how to do pretty much anything we showed you today. Now, if we look at our last week's episode, we showed you some trick-or-treats because twit.tv slash kh has our giant library of episodes. I'm so gangster. Last week, yeah, absolutely, because you're rocking an SSD. That's, right. <laughs> That's how you know you're gangster. How can you not be a gangster? You can see our show SSD. notes. These go on forever. Best show notes in the business, by the way. Yes, absolutely. The best show notes at twit.tv slash kh or at twit.tv slash kh. And you know what? If you have questions after you look at those fantastic show notes, you could always reach us at knowhow at twit.tv. Yeah, you can send us an email. You got show Damn. ideas? Let us know over there. Uh, big fan of our Google Plus community at this point. We've got around, I'm going to say over 4,000, almost 5,000 active Google Plus uh, community members. That's available at gplus.to slash twitkh. Uh, we actually put up a little mini video, a little teaser of what's coming up next week. We're messing with our uh, NES mod, oh. and we're asking for your help. So if you got some ideas, go to our community, gplus.to slash twitkh, watch the video, and comment because these discussions are public are fantastic because instead of sending an email everyone gets to have a conversation big fan of that and you'll see both Ayaz and i inside that social media chat room in google plus but that's not the only thing we do he's Ayaz on twitter i'm padre sj on twitter but if you want to reach out to the show specifically all you got to do is write your question write your comment write the thing that you want with the hashtag twit kh Hashtag. Twit KH, we've got a safe search. Always taking a look at that. We've got some show ideas, actually. And somebody actually wrote in about the NES mod of, uh, that was on the Google Plus thing. So it was weird. So they watched it on Google Plus, and then they put it on Twitter. That's you can meta. use all of them, by it's the meta, way. Man. You can well, even send us an email if you wanted to, like you mentioned before. Mind blown. We also have a survey. It's, you know, we do this once a year. Twit.tv slash survey. It asks you a simple question. 
which Twitch shows you regularly listen to or watch, and not in that order because I messed up <laughs> reading it. You just click, you hit next. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing an NES mod with Brian. We're going to finally try to cram his Raspberry Pi and properly place it into a, a Nintendo shell. What, what are you looking at? Well, I'm, I'm going to be looking at podcast cameras. I'm going to tell you what you should be looking at, whether you do a live broadcast or a really well-produced podcast, the kind of optics that, uh, that you, should, you should get into your, your studio. So you could have, like, really good production. Yeah. Oh, that reminds me. Ooh. Know How is up for a podcast award at podcastawards.com under Best Produced. We do a lot of work to do this show, and you guys can vote once a day for Best Produced. Uh, that would be Know How. Tons of Twitch shows are actually up against each other, but in the best produced section, we're the only one. So vote for us like crazy if you'd like. Yeah. I'm a big fan of that. Oh, and, Tons oh, of Twitch shows available. And you know something, Jermaine, did you know that if you used a service like ProXBN, which anonymizes your IP, you could actually vote more than once a day? You could. Mm -hmm. But don't do that, that would be dishonest. That would be dishonest, and we wouldn't write scripts or anything that could possibly do that. Mm. That's just crazy. <laughs> Wow. So that pretty much does it for us this so. week. We record this show live-ish live -ish. <laughs> at around 3 o'clock Pacific time at live.twit.tv. There's a live chat room. We're reading it. We might not be able to type because we're we're busy, you know, hosting and explaining. It takes a little bit of work, you know, production yeah. stuff. Yeah. Anyway, but that, now that you know how to kind of hack Verizon and how to have a nice, beautiful mobile VPN solution, go out and do it. Bye. <laughs> You found that, you found that link.